Welcome back. I hope everyone had a good chance to get some networking done, make some social connections, and that everyone's doing great. Um, our next speaker is someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years. Uh, the first time that I ever read an article by this gentleman and heard him speak, I knew immediately that I liked the way he thinks. He took the idea of sustainability, the idea of environmental friendliness, and connected it to the business purpose. He speaks business language, he is a business school professor, and he talks about how we're going to integrate this into innovation and through our, our business strategies. Um, Stu Hart is currently the chair of the, um, the SC Johnson Chair of the Sustainable Global Enterprise at Cornell University. Before joining Cornell, Stu taught strategic management and founded the Center for Sustainable Enterprise at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Prior to that, um, Stu helped found the Corporate Environmental Management Program at the University of Michigan. His new book is called Capitalism at the Crossroads. Please join me in welcoming Stuart Hart. Morning, everybody. Back from coffee, that's good. Well, it's good to be back here in uh, Spartan slash Wolverine country. You know, as, uh, uh, you know, Dave sort of tipped my hand a little bit. I'm slightly biased, you know, having spent about 15 years in Ann Arbor, but it's, it's good to be back. Uh, and I mean, we have the big game coming up this weekend. I know there's got to be fans here in the room, you know, but uh, yeah, that should be an interesting game. What I'd like to do is uh, build on what Tom talked about this morning. Uh, I want to try to see if I can't put some flesh on the bones of this idea of sustainability as a business strategy to really drive it home. I think we've only scratched the surface when it comes to the opportunity, the scope of the opportunity that is out there. I mean, I believe sustainability is the biggest business opportunity of the 21st century. But in order for us to get there, we have to do a better job of relating this back to what it means inside the company from the standpoint of driving performance. But before I even do that, I want to spend a little bit of time stepping back and setting the context, setting the tone uh, for what we're going to be talking about. Because I, I really think we're at a very unique point in history, in the world history, in human history. Hence the title of my book, uh, Capitalism at the Crossroads, with a little bit of shameless self-promotion, you know, the cover there. But uh, if you can read through, you get a general sense of what I'm talking about. But let me just try to scope it a little bit before we begin on the more pointed business agenda. To really get our mind around this, I think it's worthwhile to go back, you know, sort of think back about 100 years. Let's pretend it's 1905 and imagine what the world was like at that, at that point in history. Uh, if you kind of scroll through your, you know, world history and all that. You'll probably remember that if it was 1905, it was good to be British. You know? That was the thing to be in 1905. You know, the empire was at its peak. They were on top of the world. They emerged from the Industrial Revolution as the clear, dominant player in the world. It was the first era of globalization. The world was interconnected. Uh, if you were British, you could travel anywhere in the world without a passport. The world was their oyster. It wasn't so great for the colonies, but it was great to be British. Yeah. And in general, people back then were writing a lot about globalization. They were writing about the fact that the, the world economy had become so interlinked that it was po almost impossible to imagine war. You know, that war was, was passe in 1905. Sound familiar? Well, who could have possibly guessed the scant nine years later that the world would descend into World War and then a continuing stream for the next 30 years of fascism, the rise of communism, depression, so forth. I mean, no one could have ever imagined anything like that in 1905. Clearly, they didn't anticipate it. There were storm clouds, there were signs, there was the rising, there was a rise in fascism, there was a rise in nihilism and terrorism, there were assassinations. McKinley was assassinated, right? The U.S. president back about that time, remember that? There are a lot of strange similarities, I would say, to pe between what happened 100 years ago and increasingly 
the world that we face today. Only the argument I'd, I'd like to make is that the challenges that we face today are much more substantial and significant than they were 100 years. And therefore, the crossroads that we stand at is much more daunting. Much more daunting. Because you think about what's happened since just the end of World War II, right? That over that 30-year period from, you know, 1914 to the end of the Second World War, capitalism almost died. By the 1940s, there were two primarily capitalist countries left, the United States and England. Had things broken slightly differently, we could be living in a very different world today than we are. But the Allies prevailed. You know, industrial, you know, the industrial society came roaring back, you know, kind of Fordism, you know, after the Second World War. And sure enough, we've arrived at a point in history now which is really quite unique. I want to argue that we're at a very unique point in history. Uh, that, in fact, I think we're living at the most important, uh, important time in all of human history. And of course, every generation thinks that this is true, right? There's a word for it, it's called chronocentrism. But I think we actually have an, some empirical justification for it. Think about it for a minute. Uh, I'm a baby boomer, as many of you in the room. I, you know, I can see some of those baby boomer faces out there. You know, so I was born after the Second World War. Back then, the human population in the world was two billion. What is it today? About 6.4. So in, in my lifetime, the human population has grown from 2 to 6.4 billion. If I live to be a ripe old age, you know, keep my fingers crossed, I could see 8 or 9 billion people on the planet. You know, think about that for a minute. You know, that when you consider that it took all of human history, however long you believe that to be, you know, that's your personal choice. Uh, but up in, you know, all of human history up to the point of, say, the American Revolution to get to 1 billion, and then from the time of the American Revolution to the time I was born to get to 2, and then in one human lifetime, we've seen the human population grow from 2 to 6.4. It could go to 8 or 9 billion in one human lifetime. Nothing like that has ever happened before in the history of the world. Right? Nothing. I mean, we truly live at a very unique time. And when you consider that the energy, the resources, the impacts that have been committed, that are being committed, uh, the bulk of that goes to support only about the 800 million wealthiest people like us. Right? and yet we're stressing most natural systems beyond the point that they can handle, it becomes difficult to see how that can continue. It can't happen for 6.4 billion, let alone eight or nine. So the decisions that we take, the strategies we make, the policies we conceive over the next 10 or 20 years are gonna tell the story. That's why I think that truly we are at a crossroads as a society, you know, as, as a world. But it's also why I'm actually optimistic, uh, because I think the role of business in this is crucial, that capitalism is at a crossroads, that we have, especially for big companies, big global companies, we have this continuing expectation for growth. You know, the 90s, the roaring 90s, we had a little downturn there, but then the expectation is right back. You know, for all of you that are in big companies, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't go away. Say the thirst for growth, you know, double-digit returns, where is it going to come from? That's the fundamental question that most big companies that I know of are struggling with. But yet the problem is that most of the current established markets are saturated. You know, they're not growing. They're stagnant growth. So where is the growth going to come from? You know, most big companies I know of are looking to move out into so-called emerging markets. That takes them out into the developing world in various ways. You know, that also extends their reach, also increases their footprint, more and more impact you know, as we move out into the developing world. But that's what needs to happen if, in fact, companies are going to continue to grow. But the problem then, of course, is that we run increasingly into backlash. You know? As we continue to extract resources to have impacts on underlying natural systems to drive local people, you know, off the land, to force migration to cities looking for opportunity in the developing world, as we continue to serve the needs primarily of the 800 million richest people and not the rest of the world, we see a rising tide of anti-globalization sentiment. Yeah. Now, you know, there's one indicator of that, which is 
the rich kids from the U.S. and Western Europe protesting against the WTO and so forth. I mean, that, that's significant, but I don't see that as the, as the most important or the most fundamental indicator. To me, the indicator is what's actually going on in what we might call the base or the bottom of the pyramid. What's, what's happening among the other four or five billion people in the world who have been largely bypassed uh, or marginalized by globalization as it's played out so far? And there, you know, the picture isn't that pretty. You know, aside from some parts of East Asia, a lot of the rest of the world, whether it's Latin America or Africa or other parts of Asia, you know, they're, they're not doing so well. Yeah. And increasingly, people at the base of the pyramid, as information spreads, know that. And it makes them increasingly frustrated, angry, humiliated, yeah. alienated. And you, we can see that played out. Certainly, you know, look what's going on in Latin America right now. Look what's happening in Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela. You know, we've, had, we've seen uh, popularly elected governments overthrown, in the case of Ecuador now, three times in the last three years. You know, and we kind of pick the leaders up by a helicopter and bring them to the United States. You know? Largely by an indigenous people's movement that feels as though its, you know, its needs have not been met by structural adjustment and the capitalist regime. I mean, that's the truth. Or look at India, right, where the uh, government was essentially voted out by the rural masses who felt as though they were, their needs were not being served by the form of global capitalism that had played out. This is a huge challenge, but I would argue opportunity for us because as long as we continue this kind of vicious circle of environmental degradation, poverty, and inequity, then the anti-globalization movement will continue to be fed. You know, it's a vicious circle. So you end up with these two forces colliding with each other. And it raises the question, must corporations' thirst for growth and profit serve only to exacerbate degradation and inequity? And there are a lot of people out there who think they know the answer, you know, especially in the, you know, the Western anti-globalization movement. The answer to them is yes, you know, and if we can just bring down those big companies, by God, everything will be great. You know, we can get back to local production, you know, and on and on. Obviously, I wouldn't be standing here if I believed that to be the case. I don't think that that leads us where we need to go. In fact, on the contrary, I think the, the answer to that question has to be a resounding no. But the only way that the answer to the question can be a resounding no is for us, and I'll use the word us, you know, as, as business people, and business people extended, to figure out how we design a more inclusive form of capitalism, a form of capitalism that in fact can lift up all of the people of the world, 6.4 billion, not just the 800 million richest, and to do so in a way that doesn't, not only doesn't destroy the planet, but actually regenerates it. That's our fundamental challenge. And I, I believe, and, and I guess what I want to talk to, with you about today is that business, commerce, the private sector, is in the prime position to drive us in that direction, even more so than government and the civil, and civil society. Now, obviously, government and civil society are very important, but I want to argue that business is the key actor when it comes to driving this agenda forward. It's the only institution that truly is global, that has the resources, that has the technology, that has the global reach, that has the ability to leverage learning, that has the clout to pull together to the table all the necessary partners. It's the only institution really in a position to do this. And I want to argue that not only can it be done, but you can make money doing it. But to do that, I think as Tom uh, talked about this morning, we're going to have to do a much better job of figuring out what this notion of sustainability really means in business terms. Because what I've just done is kind of the 40,000 foot cruise, and you've probably heard a version of that before. Right? It's one thing to have you know, this grand vision about you know, what's going on in the world. It's another to land it in terms of the business and what are we actually going to do as a company to respond to the sort of the, the driving forces that I've just described. And here I think this, this uh, quote by Bill Ruckelshaus is particularly instructive. You know, Bill, Bill said this maybe seven or eight years ago. I'm sure a lot of you know uh, Bill. He was at one time U.S. EPA administrator. And he said, sustainability is as foreign a concept to managers in capitalist societies as profits are to managers in the former Soviet Union. Now he meant it at least partially to be funny. Right? But I think that there's a really important uh, grain of truth to what he's saying. That this whole notion of sustainability is pretty fuzzy. Let's face it, right? It's, it's a buzzword, right? I mean, 
Uh, it means different things to different people. You know, it kind of covers such a broad waterfront that you're never quite sure what people are talking about when they say sustainability. It's a little bit like strategy, right? So I mean, I've got a double problem because I'm a professor of strategy who's interested in sustainability. That's a big problem, you know? But I think it's true, you know? I mean, I, all the time I have these conversations with people about sustainability. You know, it seems to be going pretty well. We're a minute or two into the conversation. And I realize at that point, you know, this person's talking about something totally different than me. Yeah. You had that experience? <laughs> I mean, this happens to me all the time, and it's maddening, right? I mean, it's one, of, it's one of the things that's utterly maddening about sustainability is that there's this imprecision to it. But it's also one of the exciting things, because you think about it again, strategy professor, so I'll put on my strategy hat. When things have become totally clear-cut, completely defined, everything's been set down, you know, in an operating manual and so forth, well, all the money was made a long time ago. Right. So from a strategy point of view, as a strategist, we should revel in ambiguity. We should seek it out because it's an opportunity to actually frame it in a way that makes sense for us. So I'm going to argue that there's no one way, you know, it's not about creating a global standard for sustainability, because the last time I checked, nobody made any money from following a standard. You make money by innovating, by following your own path. But there, have to, there has to at least be some common framework for thinking about it. And that's what I'd like to develop with you now, you know, for the, in the time that we have left, is to, is to tease out a framework that hopefully you can use as a guide in thinking about strategy in relation to, the, in the relation to business. And also, it makes it a lot easier to have a coherent conversation with someone about it because there's then more precision about what you're actually talking about. Okay? So, I mentioned that sustainability is a buzzword and, and covers a lot of uh, territory. Well, you can see up in front here on the slide, probably can't read all of the uh, fine print, but my colleague Mark Milstein and I, uh, you know, who have written about this, we, uh, I don't know, we spent a half an hour or so and just, we just kind of brainstormed a list of as many terms that fit under this big umbrella of sustainability as we could think about. And you know, so here's the list that we came up with. It's by no means comprehensive. And I'm sure you'll see there, you know, some of your favorites, you know, some, some of your pet, you know, kind of buzzwords. But then there'll probably be some weird ones, you know, that you don't, I mean, like, what's that? You know, like, what, what is radical transactiveness? You know, I'll take responsibility for it. I'll talk about it a little later. Uh, you know, what's B to 4B? You know, that, there's going to be some familiar territory and then some unfamiliar territory because sustainability is populated by tribes. You know, there's kind of people coming at it from different perspectives. So you have all of, all of these buzzwords. And again, if you're a business person and you encounter this, your first reaction is, is to say, my God, this is crazy. Please make it go away. You know, that it just, it comes at you in this huge waft and you don't know what to do with it uh, because it's, it's so multidimensional and is so undifferentiated that you don't really know how to deal with it. So what I want to do again is to try, again, being a strategy guy, to try to create some frame for thinking about this. And of course, being a strategy professor, for those of you that have been in business schools, <laughs> you know that if I don't start with a two-by-two two matrix, that I get fired, right? So I'll begin with that. Uh, and two-by-two two matrices actually, I think, have a lot of validity because, you know, there's a chance that you might actually remember it, which is a good thing, right? So this one is pretty simple-minded, which is good. Um, there's a vertical axis, which is primarily about time. So there are a set of things that can start today that will have near-term payoff. Some others that you might start today, but it's going to take a little longer before they pay off. Maybe not forever, more intermediate term or longer term on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, you can think more in terms of where do, th where do things happen? What's the locus of activity? So some are more internal to the company. They'll have to do with people, human resources, technology, resources, capability, that sort of thing, competency. And then others on the right-hand side will have more to do with the company embedded in the larger community within which it exists, what Tom was referring to, kind of the, the, the stakeholder net. Obviously, suppliers and customers, but also the community, regulators, civil society, pressure groups, the media, you name it. You know, that, that's sort of the external uh, context within which the firm finds itself. 
And if we take this basic two by two, we can array as a starting point the dimensions that are important to driving shareholder value. Because I think it's important for us to relate sustainability to the creation of shareholder value. If we can't do that, then it's going to be difficult to see how we can drive this agenda forward in the company. And so what I want to do is array those elements that are important to driving shareholder value first, and then we'll talk about how sustainability comes into that. Now, obviously, to, to drive shareholder value, you've got to do many things well. Now, we get a lot of focus of attention on short-term, you know, quarterly earnings and that sort of thing. Sure, that's important, but that's not the whole game by any stretch of the imagination. So down here in the lower left box, you know, this is where probably most of the focus is these days. You know, you've got to reduce costs, you've got to reduce risk, you've got to operate efficiently. That's how you're going to generate quarterly earnings. No one disputes that. That's, utter, that's utterly necessary. You have to do that or else it's going to be difficult to see how you generate value on an ongoing basis. But at the same time, also in today's business, thinking about those existing products and processes, today's business, if you don't build legitimacy, maintain reputation, then your right to operate can be compromised. Right? Well, you know, look at our friends at Enron, right? great example. I can show you my Enron stock certificate. It's not generating a lot of value these days. So uh, this lower right reputation, legitimacy angle on things is pretty important. If you don't do that, then it's going to be difficult to, to uh, build value over time. But it's not enough just to do these two things. These are important when it comes to the execution of today's business, today's products and processes. But you also got to be thinking all the time about what are the new capabilities, what are the new competencies that we need in order to be competitive tomorrow. If all you do is run the current assets more efficiently and try to do that forever, eventually you run them in the ground. Or somebody comes along with a two by four and hits you in the back of the head because they've got a completely new and better way of doing things. You know, they've, they've leapfrogged you. So unless you're thinking constantly about repositioning, constantly about acquiring new capability, then it's difficult to see how you generate value on an ongoing basis. And as much as we like to say those, you know, those bloody analysts on Wall Street, all they're, all they're worried about you know, is quarterly earnings, it's just not true, right? I mean, analysts are looking at this as much as anything else. And they're also looking at this last piece, which is more external. They're looking at whether or not the company has a credible and coherent story about how it's going to grow in the future. What is the growth path and trajectory? If you don't have a credible and coherent story, strategy, about how you're going to grow in the future, then stock price usually stays flat. I know a lot of companies that have done a good job on the bottom part here, maybe even in the upper left, but they, don't, they haven't had a compelling story about how they're going to grow the company, and the result is, you know, stock's a flat liner. Yeah. Now, you know, we certainly know companies that have been really strong on the growth path and trajectory story that have nothing else going on, like the dot-coms, right? But ultimately, they turned into the dot-bombs. So that didn't work very well either, right? So the, I think the argument here would be you've got to do all of these things well all the time if you're going to generate shareholder value added on an ongoing basis. Does it make sense? I don't think there's anything controversial here. This is basic balance scorecard kind of thinking. But I think it's worthwhile to at least lay that out to say that this is what the company has to be doing if it's going to drive shareholder value as a starting point. So now the question becomes, if that adds up, if we accept that, if that makes sense, then where does sustainability come into this? How do we think about sustainability? And that's, that's the frame that I want to build. So let's start with all those buzzwords that we talked about. Because you can use this framework to do a buzzword sort. You know, it's kind of a, an informal factor analysis, if you will. And if you do that, then they begin to shake out into some categories that actually hang together, where you can have a meaningful conversation and where you can actually show how a particular approach might actually drive performance in each one of these four quadrants. You know, that there are a set of things that you can do that can help drive down cost and reduce risk, that can build reputation and legitimacy, that can position you for the future, and that can provide opportunities for growth. But they're very different things, and the problem is we often mix them together. So if we take our first sort, we'll start down here in the lower left box, because I think this is where most companies, in fact, did start 
and where we see the, the most advanced development that's occurred, you know, out there in the corporate world. And here I'll just quickly read through them, you know, the, the buzzwords that fit into this, into this space. EMS, environmental management systems, greening, pollution prevention, eco-efficiency, risk management, environmental management, ISO 14000, waste reduction, resource productivity. Well, you know, I think it's kind of obvious what's going on here, right? I mean, th this is pretty much about running the internal operations of the current business more efficiently from, from an eco point of view and from a social point of view. That rather than running our take, make, waste, kind of industrialized uh, legacy operations, just continuing that way, in fact, we can intervene in the operation to reduce and even prevent the waste from occurring in the first place. And if we do that, we can actually reduce cost. Now, that may sound obvious to all of us in the room here, you know, the idea of pollution prevention right, or eco-efficiency, which the World Business Council for Sustainable Development has been touting for the last decade or more. But you know, it wasn't so obvious even 15 or 20 years ago. It wasn't obvious at all. Right? In fact, it was a huge breakthrough in my view. And if you'll pardon me for a moment, I just want to do a little bit of an aside, because I think, again, a, a historical appreciation of where this stuff come from, comes from is worthwhile because it's going to it's going to figure into how we move forward. So if we think back, you know, about the, the, in terms of the post-war years, it, it wasn't that way at all, right? I mean, in the post-war years, we restarted the engine and it was Fordism, right? It was high, high volume standardized mass production, take, make, waste, you know, heat, beat, treat, whatever you want to call it. And thing, things reached a point where it just became intolerable, you know, when when we had rivers catching on fire and that sort of thing. You know, there was, it was time to do something about it. So public policy was used as the vehicle. We created a wall of environmental and social regulation, created the Environmental Protection Agency. And incidentally, I, you know, back then, uh, I really saw that as the right course. It probably was the right course at the time. Companies back in the late 60s, early 70s showed no inclination to do anything about this. So we slammed them over the head with end-of-pipe regulation, right? You know, and I really thought that was the right thing. If we just got a big enough bat, you know, to beat these companies into submission with, then everything would be great. Yeah. The problem is that any initiative is going to have unintended consequences. So while you may solve some problems, you create new ones. And I think in the case of this, what it did was program a whole generation of business people to think about these issues as negatives. That, oh my God, you know, I mean, it's just, this is just a you know, cost, liability, you know, problem lawsuit, you know, jail time, right? I mean, it, you, you can run a thought experiment, in fact. Even today, I would submit, even with my MBA students, you know, I'll run this thought experiment. This is still embedded in their mindset, right? So try this out just for a moment, a little thought experiment. Assume that you're running a business, and maybe you are, you know, but in whatever company you're in. And uh, so you have your office, you have an outer office, your assistant's out there. The phone rings, it's your assistant on the phone. He says, there are a couple of people here to see you. It's extremely urgent that they see you. They must see you right away. Those people are the VP for Environment, Health and Safety and the VP for Public Affairs. What comes to mind? Be honest. <laughs> you know what you're thinking, right? Just what I said. Oh my God, a spill, you know. Uh, somebody's after us, you know, consent decree, you know, a violation, you know, if you had a back door to your office, you'd be out it. Right? Am I right? Okay, erase that, run the next thought experiment. Same scenario, phone rings, uh, your assistant says, two people here to see you, it's really important that they see you right away, it's urgent, and those two people are the VP for marketing and the VP for product development. What comes to mind? You know where I'm going, right? Why is that? I mean, we've been programmed to believe that one is a problem and the other is an opportunity. There's no reason for that. You know? And I think the, what, what started us down the track of being able to deprogram on that sort of knee-jerk idea that environment and social issues are just problems and liabilities, what, what allowed that to begin to come together was this, what I'll call the pollution prevention or greening revolution. And it started during the 80s when the quality management converged with environment and social issues. 
because a lot of you will remember, especially in a place like Michigan, you know, that uh, back then there was another set of assumptions. Just like the assumption was we can't have a clean environment and a, and a vital economy, right? We've got to grow the economy first, and then we'll worry about environmental issues because it's a drag on the economy. That's an assumption. Just like, you know, in the old days there was the assumption that, well, you can't have high quality and low cost at the same time, right? Well, but then the Japanese came, you know, to shore with a, with a set of strategies that proved that one wrong. And Detroit and a lot of other manufacturers spent the next 20 years trying to figure out how to catch up, right? How do you design quality in rather than expect, inspecting it in, right? Getting from the end of pipe thinking to internal process management, that's what quality management is about. Well, when quality management combined with environmental issues, that's what happened, right? We realized that, in fact, you don't have to just wait till you make a mess and then clean it up with, ex with expensive pollution control equipment. You can intervene in the plant, in the facility, and power workers just like you do with quality management, and you don't have to make the mess in the first place. And if you don't, have to, if you don't make the mess in the first place, then you don't have to buy a lot of extra raw materials that are going to be flushed out into the air and the water as waste. You're going to drive more raw material into end product that you can sell. I mean, it makes so much sense. Why didn't anybody think of that 20 years ago? But they didn't, right? Because there, there were embedded assumptions about this, that that's just the way it is, you know? I remember growing up, that was called the smell of money. Right? That it, you have the, the smokestacks belching. Sorry, kid, that's just the way it is. You know, if you want economic progress, you have to put up with that. That's bogus, right? We now know that that's completely wrong. That was the revolution that occurred, I think, in the mid-'80s around this idea, these ideas of eco-efficiency. And so, you know, most major companies have been, have gotten this one, are well down the track of pollution prevention, eco-efficiency. And, and, and that's what opened up the whole possibility that, in fact, business, environment, social performance can travel together, I think, as Tom was describing. So where have we been more recently? Well, I think that's morphed now into this next set of buzzwords over in the lower right-hand box. I'll just read through those quickly. Industrial ecology, stakeholder management, life cycle management, design for environment, green design, corporate citizenship, full cost accounting, take back transparency, and corporate governance. Now, that's a little more complicated ball of issues there, right? Uh, because you, there you've got a set of things around governance and stakeholders as well as design issues. Well, how does that work? Well, you think about it. We're now moving from ins inside the facility on the lower left to thinking about the entire product system, the entire product life cycle. And we'll have several sessions focusing on that uh, here over the next couple of days. This obviously is a huge increase in bandwidth f over just pollution prevention. Because now we've got to be thinking about everything that goes on upstream, where do the raw materials come from, what, what are the impacts associated with it, what happens downstream all the way out to the product in use, out to the end of its useful life. Can we take it back? How do we deploy the voices in, or, that uh, upstream and downstream into the design process in the first place? That's called stakeholder dialogue. You've got to bring new voices in if you're going to do that and do it effectively. And it's going to have an impact on the design if we do it well. Right? I mean, if we don't do it well, then you end up with what, what turned out to be, you know, the sort of bad green products of the 90s when we had, you know, kind of lazy thinking around this where you just kind of slap dash some recycled material into a product and then stick it on the market at a higher price. Because after all, you know, if you're environmental, you should be willing to pay a premium, even if it doesn't work as well. Right? I mean, th those were the bad green products of the 90s. And that's another legacy we have to overcome, a little bit like, you know, the problem of end-of-pipe regulations that I just described. And I think that's where we are now. You know, we're in this lower right-hand box, a lot of us, you know, trying to figure this out. We'll call it the product stewardship space, that it's about how do we think about entire product systems and how do we improve products and build reputation and legitimacy in the process? I think that's what we just heard with, with Tom, but I think there's even more going on there as well, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that further. Uh, but you can see some big mistakes in this space too. I mentioned the idea of not very well thought through green products, but then there are also companies like, you know, you think about some of the fiascos like Shell, you know, uh, around the Brent Spar and Shell in Nigeria, where failing to include voices that have an important, an important perspective ends up blowing up in their face, you know, and their legitimacy is gone as a result of it. 
So all this stuff comes into play, and I think, you know, the Europeans in particular have been active in this lower right-hand space around stakeholder dialoguing, around life cycle management. As you know, there are, there are uh, extended producer responsibility laws in Europe, which are more or less forcing this issue more quickly than here in the United States. But I think that this is still a really important space. It's probably where most of us are today, uh, but it's by no means the whole show, by no means. Right? because, of course, the entire upper part of the model is still blank. <laughs> but you know, for a lot of companies, I think that, f that sustainability for them is about these two things. They think in terms of the lower left pollution prevention stuff, the lower right uh, product stewardship, and if we just do that, we're sustainable. But I think we all know in our gut that that's not true. For those of you that will be hearing Bill McDonough over the next day or so, uh, and this will be a message loud and clear from Bill as well, that we've also got to be thinking about how we get to tomorrow's technologies and markets. It's not just about incremental improvement of today's products and processes. We've also got to be thinking about leapfrog change, innovation for tomorrow's technologies and markets. That takes us then up here to the upper left. And here we've got a set of buzzwords, another set of buzzwords. Clean technology, eco-effectiveness, and that's a, you know, McDonough and Braungardism. Biomimicry, people are familiar with biomimicry? I see a few heads going up. A whole emerging field, you know, Janine Benya is probably the most effective spokesperson for that. But there's a ton of work going on, you know, in companies, in universities. There are two or three programs in biomimicry at Cornell alone. Yeah. The idea that nature can be a mentor. Rather than heat be treat, let's understand how it is that nature can create materials like spider webs and abalone shells and so forth that are as strong and durable and uh, sophisticated as anything that we can design and manufacture. But, you know, the last time I checked, spiders didn't have boiling cauldrons of sulfuric acid and didn't emit a lot of toxics in the process. So, you know, the, the, this whole area is an important l way of thinking in terms of leapfrogging. It's about inherently clean and sustainable technology. As Bill would describe it, cradle to cradle, closed loops, and even thinking in terms of being restorative, which requires you to think in a fundamentally different way than you would be in the lower left box. Now, the, part of the confusion here comes in, in my view, that oftentimes terms like clean technology ends up muddying, uh, you, you, it ends up kind of blurring these two together, the lower left and the upper left. Whereas in my view, the logic for the lower left around eco-efficiency is totally different, the business logic is totally different, different people doing it than the upper left. And we need to keep that very clear, very straight in our minds because the strategic logic is completely different, the people that will do it are totally different, and the, and the payoff in terms of innovation repositioning, completely different. Think about a company like DuPont as an example. Oh, so, you say DuPont, most people, what comes to mind? It's a chemical company. Well, you look at DuPont today, it's really not so much of a chemical company anymore. Sure, they still have some chemical products. But over the past 10, 15 years, DuPont has undergone a pretty fundamental transfer, transformation. They've, they've more or less altered their entire underlying technology portfolio. Today, DuPont is much more of a biology and life science company, an information company, and a service company, right? They got a big safety consulting business, for example, and a seed company. You know, ag is probably their biggest business now, and not just pesticides right? and fertilizers. Right? The company has undergone a transformation. A lot of that has been driven by the realization that their old technologies, their old competencies, their old capabilities, most of which were based upon petrochemical feedstocks and the hammering of those into submission, is probably not the future. So the company has been systematically moving out of that space and into new space. It's been portfolio reallocation. That's what, you know, for an incumbent firm, that's what the upper left box is all about, right? Now, sure, in their, in, in their existing plants, they're also looking to re cut waste, reduce emissions. That's the lower left. That's a completely different logic, and we better be clear about that. So the upper left, in my, in my view, is where the big opportunities for the future lie. But the question is, how do we make this commercial, right? Because there are a lot of companies that have blown a lot of big money on whiz-bang technologies, and then there's no market for it, right? You pour a lot of money into R&D, and then you pound your head against the wall for the next 10 years, 
and there's no uptake, right? I mean, nobody's interested in buying it. Look at solar, you know, look at renewable energy. I mean, I, I've been around long enough to remember, you know, like for 30 years, those of us interested in, you know, kind of in the environmental movement, we've been saying we need to increase, you know, the uptake, the penetration of renewable energy and solar and distributed generation. And I, you know, I remember back in the 70s, you know, there was that little period of time there during the Carter administration, right, when you had these incentives in place, there was uptake for a while and then, you know, it went away. But they used to show those charts back then where, you know, you'd see, well, here's utility generated electricity per kilowatt hour and here's solar, right? It's a whole bunch more expensive. But you know, if we just get some scale and experience over time, the price will come, the cost and the price will come down. And then maybe out here 10 years from now, the curves will cross and that's when we'll really see it pick up. You seen those curves? I saw them back, you know, like in 1978. I see the same curve today. Right? It's this continuously receding thing into the future. Why is that? <laughs> well, you think about it. I, it. To me, it's fundamentally because most leapfrog inherently clean and sustainable technologies are disruptive in a Clay Christensen sense. For those of you that know Clay Christensen's work on disruptive innovation, and one of the things that we know, and Clay and I have, have partnered on, on some work that we've done jointly, one of the things we know is that typically disruptive innovations don't take root first in the established mainstream markets. They typically find early markets, they would be more off markets, niche markets, quote, down markets. And if you look back through the history of industrial transformation or technological innovation, whenever these kinds of disruptive innovations have come forward, that's the way it almost always works. But yet, so many companies spend time trying to ram these new technologies into the existing market, only to end up kind of throwing their hands up in frustration. You think about it, what have most American or even Western European-based solar companies or renewable energy companies done? They've targeted the American or the Western European market as the entry market, right? Well, sure, you can say solar is growing 20% a year, and it is, so we should be satisfied with that but it's off a tiny base, right? And it's still a fraction of 1% of actual energy you know, production worldwide. I mean, we haven't really made any headway when you consider total energy consumption worldwide and the rate that it's growing. And when you think of it in terms of its disruptive potential, it makes sense that it wouldn't come in here first. Why would it, right? I mean, you've got an institution, set of institutions that are stacked against you. Most of the regulations are designed, you know, to, to perpetuate the investments that utilities have already made, which are big centralized generating facilities, transmission lines. You know, distributed generation, by definition, you don't need that, right? You generate close to the point of use. It's disruptive. Right? You got massive subsidies that encourage the perpetuation of the use of fossil fuels. How do you break in against that? You know, most customers are well served, generally, you know, unless you're in California or now on the Gulf Coast. You know? uh, so, you know, you flick the switch, it comes on. Why, you know, a lot of, why would Americans in large numbers move over to having some crazy panels on their house or, you know, a fuel cell or when it's unproven, you don't have a service infrastructure, they're not going to do it. Right? But you think about the developing world, you know, think about those countries that I talked about at the outset. You know, there, there are two billion plus people in the world with no electricity who still want the functionality that we have, you know, even basic functionality like light at night. And how do they achieve that? Well, they, they, they achieve it by paying money. They may not have a lot of it, but they, they use it in a discerning way. They buy candles, kerosene, lanterns, dry cell batteries, right? expensive, dangerous, polluting technologies. They're not served very well. They're getting ripped off. They're breathing in the fumes. Tens of thousands of people burn to death every year kicking over kerosene lanterns. Why couldn't we as capitalists figure out a business model where we could take these distributed generation renewable technologies to that space first? NGOs have already figured it out. You know, there are NGOs like uh, the Solar Electric Light Fund, Light Up the World. They've already proven that you can do this on a commercial basis. What's wrong with us, right? Why can't BP and Shell figure this out? Right? Well, the truth is they're starting to, right? That this is, the, this is the real opportunity that we have, is to take these transformative technologies, these technologies that have the potential to really leapfrog us, 
renewable energy, life sciences, different applications of nanotechnology, certainly wireless, you know, IT applications, biomimicry, biomaterials, a whole set of emerging technologies, and leverage them into use in spaces that are currently underserved. And that's what takes us over here to the last quadrant. And here we've got a set of buzzwords like sustainable development, base of the pyramid, or bottom of the pyramid, depending on uh, you know, how you want to think about it. Urban reinvestment, brownfield redevelopment, inclusive capitalism, community capitalism, civic entrepreneurship, radical transactiveness, there it is again. B to 4B, you know what that means? Business to 4 billion. That here we're looking externally now, not just the upper left is about the internal competency, technological capacity that the company needs to develop, but if you don't have a space to apply it, if you don't have a market, then what good is it? And in the upper right box, we're talking about the space that has all of the growth potential for the future. This is where all the people are, right? We already talked about what the population dynamics have been over the last 50 years. Well, it turns out that of those 6.4 billion, you know, four or five billion of them live at the base of the economic pyramid and have been largely ignored by people like us, you know, or even damaged. Right, their livelihoods are being cut off. They're being forced to migrate to cities. Uh, urban slums and shanty towns are proliferating at a rate that none of us could possibly conceive of. It is the fastest growing form of urban development. You know, there's a billion people living in urban slums and shanty towns today. It keeps up at the rate it's going. It'll be two billion by 2015. I mean, think about that for a minute. <laughs> Mass migration from the country to the cities in search of opportunity, in search of a livelihood, and we ain't making it happen. Right? So as, as capitalists, how do we begin to think about that? If, if, if we can't figure out a way to create livelihoods where people live today, that being you know, out in rural areas and villages, then it's difficult to see how we get to a more sustainable world. If we can't figure out how to lift the base of the pyramid to create wealth on a massive scale, not just at the top of the pyramid, but the entire global pyramid, then it's difficult how to, to see how we get to a more sustainable world. Well, that's where these two things come into play, right? The, the upper right box is really about ignored spaces. That's in a sense what brownfield redevelopment is, right? You're going back to spaces that have been contaminated. You're trying to reclaim them, bring them back into the system. This is about ignored spaces. And ironically, it turns out that these ignored spaces constitute the vast majority of humanity. <laughs> which is really strange when you think about it, that you know, as business people, we have focused on the tiny, tiny minority of people with a lot of money. On the assumption, again, assumption, just like the old assumptions about, you know, you can't cut pollution and cost at the same time, you can't have high quality and look, right? On the assumption that there's no business with, you can't, have, can't do business with poor people, you know? They don't have any money, they're bad credit risk, can't loan money to poor people. I mean, these are a lot, you hear a lot of this sort of orthodoxy and you know when you hear that, you should go right to it and begin to turn it upside down because it's when you hear that sort of assumption, embedded assumption, that sort of orthodox thinking, that's where the business opportunity is. You know? that, that's what the smart people who are thinking in terms of sustainable development are doing. So you, you think of uh, probably one of the, the most used but I think important examples is Grameen Bank. People familiar with Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank? A little bit, huh? Let me quickly tell the story because I think it, it, it makes it evident that about 25 years ago, Mohammed Yunus uh, is actually a PhD economist trained here in the U.S. He was in the faculty at uh, Vanderbilt. And when Bangladesh achieved uh, independence in the early to mid-70s, he went back home to participate in the reconstruction of the country. So he took a job as a professor out in one of the rural universities at Chittagong University. And he went about his business, you know, kind of teaching his classes, delivering his lectures, and everything seemed to be going fine. But, you know, he'd finish, he'd walk out into the town, and there'd be people living in mud huts, you know, and with tin roofs and in cardboard boxes in large numbers. And eventually, this kind of wore on him, you know, sort of cognitive dissonance set in. And he decided he was going to do something about it, which is a little weird for a college professor, but, you know, he did. He, uh, so he began to walk up to these people and ask them, you know, like, why are you here? Uh, what would it take for you to get out of the, out of the space? I mean, what, what do you need? And he didn't expect a lot initially. He figured they were dumb, you know, or lazy, or some combination of all those things. 
But what he discovered quickly was that, that in every case, these people were hardworking, you know, energetic, imaginative, resourceful, but they were being held back, they were being held down, that there were constraints that they, they just were in a rut and they could not get out of it. And in every case, they were entrepreneurs, they were trying to get a business going, whatever it might be, you know, uh, making clothes, you know, uh, uh, street vendor, you know, uh, agricultural pros, wh whatever it might be. But in every case, they couldn't get any access to credit. They didn't have, they didn't own anything. They were squatters. They didn't have any collateral, so they couldn't, they couldn't borrow. So raw material suppliers basically would hold them hostage and take 98% of their profit to keep them there, right? Poverty is a business, you know? A lot of people benefit by keeping large numbers of people down. That's one of the reasons why it persists. Right? And I think it's one of the reasons why capitalism is so powerful. Capital, capitalism fundamentally is about people lifting themselves up, right? It's about enabling people to help themselves. So he compiled a list of 40 people, exactly what they needed and how much it would cost. This is 25, 30 years ago in Bangladesh. In US dollars, think to yourself how much you think that might be in total for 40 people. Quick benchmark it and then I'll tell you what the actual number is. You got a number in your head? Total US dollars for 40 people 30 years ago. It was about $45. Total. So he loaned the money to these people out of his pocket, didn't give it to them. It was not a gift, it was not charity. He loaned it, said, you need to pay me back. I'm not specifying when, but you need to pay me back. Much to his surprise, everyone paid him back within two quarters, and he was utterly shocked by that. He never expected it. Frankly, he didn't never expected to see any of them again. Uh, but they all paid him back, and this kind of made an impression on him. So he went to the local bank in Chittagong, told them the story, because he wanted them to start a loan program for the poor. What do you think the bank said? <laughs> you know what the bank said, right? Forget it. These people are dirt poor. They got no collateral. They're terrible credit risk. No way. We don't, you know, th this was a bad idea. He said, well, what, what if I guarantee the loans personally? They said, okay. So he began guaranteeing these loans, first with the, you know, those 40, then another 100, then 200. His intention was to try to convince the bank that this was a viable business, and they're stringing him along, right? So it plays, doing it for 500, 1,000 people in Chittagong, you know, luckily for him, the vast majority, well, not more than the vast majority, not, you know, 99.9% .9 pay him back, or else he'd be on the hook. So the bank says, well, okay, so it worked in Chittagong, let's see you do it in five other towns. So he goes, does it in five other towns, he comes back, they're, they're just stringing him along, you know. So he eventually becomes so frustrated, to make a long story short, he starts his own bank. It took about five years. It's the Grameen Bank, which means village bank. By last year, Grameen Bank was loaning about three quarters of a billion dollars a year just in Bangladesh, in rural areas, and had achieved a repayment rate of 99.4%. Think about it. Now, it was set up as a nonprofit, you know, high transaction cost. A lot of it was manually done in the early days. That's changing now. So what's interesting about it isn't so much, you know, what its margin is and so forth. What's interesting is he's able to build a business on this and achieve that kind of repayment rate to the point now where it, it's, the, the bank has never lost money in any year. And the business model that he put in place is just is revolutionary, right? That what it, what it does is turn banking on its head. If you want to go to the Grameen Bank for a loan, you can't, you know, you don't go to the Grameen Towers in Dhaka. The bank comes to you. It's a field organization. Because the way they do, they do due diligence is to observe you, talk to you, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, the people who are in your immediate survival network. And in fact, the loan is premised on you making good on a vision to improve your life. You know, what's your project plan? And will, the, will, you, will your friends and people in your network approve it? You get paid back that way, right? <laughs> it's peer lending on the ground. Also, many of, much of the loan portfolios gradually migrated to women, right? He discovered that it started out 50-50, but he discovered empirically that, you know, men turned out maybe to not be such credit risks, good credit risks, you know, that uh, they would typically have more grandiose ideas about what they could accomplish and then maybe didn't make good as often or they might take the money and go gamble it away, you know, or, or you know, buy a bunch of booze for their buddies. <laughs> so the portfolio has migrated more and more to women. And he's developed this business model 
that has become enormously successful and has been the premise for a lot of what's become micro lending or micro credit. It's become a world indus global industry. Citigroup's in the business now. Right? You know when Citigroup gets in the business that it's going mainstream. There's no legal basis whatsoever for these loans, right? He knows that, that you can't expect this to be based on some rule of law, like at the top of the pyramid. There's utterly no legal basis for it. If somebody defaults, you work with them, right? There's usually a good reason. They're not going anywhere, right? When rich people default, they get on a plane and they leave. <laughs> right? I mean, it's a completely different way of thinking. My point here is that if we have some imagination, it's possible to envision whole new businesses, whole new ways of serving people that can lift them up that we hadn't imagined before. And it's also a way that we begin to bring in these entirely new technologies into spaces that need it the most. It's where the big problems are. And we just need to open our bandwidth. So to summarize, we've got this portfolio. You can think of this as a portfolio. You can draw a map of your company. You can chart your company or your organization. And there are those strategies like pollution prevention and product stewardship that apply to especially to current products and processes and are going to drive value, right, in terms of cost and risk reduction, reputation, legitimacy, and so forth. And remember that for some people, when you're having a conversation about sustainability, that it may be that that's what they mean, whether you do or not. And you need to you need to kind of stick with it long enough to figure out what it is they're talking about when they say, yeah, I'm interested in sustainability. You know, you need to push on it more to tease it out into these, what are you really talking about here? But then there are these other two strategies we'll call clean technology, which is about developing new competencies, pursuing disruptive innovation, sustainability vision, which is about meeting unmet needs, raising the base of the pyramid. These are fundamentally different. This is about tomorrow's technologies and markets. It's, it's an innovation agenda, not a continuous improvement agenda. And sometimes when you're talking to people about sustainability, these are the things that they mean, whether you do or not. Like, can you imagine how productive a conversation would be about sustainability if person A is in the lower left box and person B is in the upper right? What do they have to talk about, right? It's like ships passing in the night. We need to be clear. There needs to be more precision about what it is we're talking about when it comes to sustainability and how it relates to business value. You could chart your portfolio. I would submit that most companies today, if you seriously do a charting of the portfolio, where is the energy, where are the resources being committed, where is the activity, that's where it is. Yeah. The lion's share of activity is going to be in the lower part of the matrix, what we'll call evolutionary routines, because what it does, it's based on continuous improvement of what already exists. I'm not saying that's wrong or it's bad. It's just an observation that I would say that's where most companies are today. Clearly, there is opportunity there, but I think by far the greatest opportunity is going to be more in the upper part. And why do I say that? Well, here's a quote from one of my favorite economists, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, you know, who, you know, was I think utterly brilliant, wrote, really invented the field of entrepreneurship back in the early 1900s. And this is one, just one of my favorite quotes from him. The problem that's usually being visualized is how capitalism is, administers existing industrial structures. I mean, what is a master of business administration? We spend most of our time worrying about how we run an ongoing enterprise. When it was his, his observation back then, and I think it's even more true today, that in fact, more challenging, more important, and in fact where most of the money gets made, is not running an ongoing enterprise, it's how you create and destroy new businesses. Right? How do you destroy old ones, create new ones? It's the process, the term that he coined creative destruction. Right? The relevant problem is how it creates and destroys them. That's where all the money gets made. It gets made during periods of discontinuity, not continuity. Now, a lot of people thought he was nuts, you know, back then. Because, you know, back in the 20s, and this is some data taken out of a book by Dick Foster and Sarah Kaplan called Creative Destruction, you know, in the Schumpeterian term. It's a wonderful piece of look, work by a couple of McKinsey consultants. I always hate to admit that, you know, but it's true. <laughs> and they assembled this long-term corporate performance database. Some of you may be familiar with the book. You know, it's gotten trashed a little bit because they held Enron up, you know, as a great example. But if you can look past that, uh, there's really good stuff in it. And what you see is that back, you know, in the 20s, if you were a big company, 
typically you were going to be around a long time, you know, 60, 70, even 80 years. You'd, you would be in that form with that name, under that ownership. It was, it was like you were forever, right? You were gold. But that has been gradually diminishing, as you can see, in fits and starts uh, since the 20s to the point now where if you're a big company, chances are you're around for maybe two decades, and if we continue on the path we're on, 10 years is pretty much the limit. You know, either your performance falls off, you, you demerge and split up, you get bought up by somebody, but, you know, basically your history. Right? That, that, that's the rate at which the economy is churning. So we're at a point now where by 2020, more than three quarters of the S&P 500 will consist of companies that we haven't heard of yet. Think about that. Right? Why do we spend so much time focusing on, you know, the, the nits of operating the current business more efficiently if this is true, right? And it is true. When you put this in the broader sustainability context, what we see happening, truly what is happening in the world today, is that the multinational corporations of the future are being created, but they're not being created here, right? They're being created in Brazil and India and Mexico and China and Africa. There are lots of really interesting new companies that are springing up in those places doing a lot of what I've just described. They're figuring out how to get out into rural areas and into shantytown communities. They're driving technology development to serve those spaces. A lot of it is leapfrog innovation. That's four or five billion people we're talking about. Right? That's the future. And if we don't figure out how to get there, it's hard to see how we're going to have a sustainable business. So I guess if I were a leader of a Western multinational company today, or even a Japanese multinational company today, I'd be worried, yeah. but also excited. You know, it's just that we, it's such an incredible opportunity, but we, we have to figure out how to open our eyes to it. So future priorities for me are clearly up here. You know, we've got to be thinking in terms of revolutionary routines. It's about learning new competencies and capabilities to carry off the strategies in the upper part of this model. That's really the challenge and the opportunity we have. So just to wrap up, to close, it has been a long and winding road, you know, since the end of the Second World War, you know, that I've been describing. And we're only part way down it, you know, that in the post-war years, you know, the industrial machine came roaring back, you know, and, and you know, sort of pollution you know, that's how we have economic progress. That was the smell of money, you know, sort of totally oblivious to environmental and social issues. But we saw, you know, then that produced the end of pipe reaction regulation. We're going to make these buggers pay, you know, to reduce their negative impact. That created this trade-off, you know, this kind of sense that this is a trade-off. Social and environmental performance is a trade-off against economic performance. That it was an obligation, maybe, or a requirement. You know, if you didn't do it, you're going to jail. But the greening revolution, starting in the 80s and 90s, has kind of liberated us from that. It's actually reframed this, at least in, in smart companies, more as an opportunity around product stewardship, pollution prevention, kind of the eco-efficiency way of thinking that there is a win-win. Doesn't mean it's automatic. Still means you've got to invest in capability and not everybody's going to be able to do it as well. But that this greening way of thinking is only partial. Right? It's about today's products and processes. It's more incremental. It's about continuous improvement. It's not going to really get, get us where we need to be in terms of the world, nor in terms of the company. Right? That, you know, you see a company like uh, uh, BP, and they, they were somewhat audacious a couple of years back when they launched this new slogan and ad campaign called Beyond Petroleum. Right? You've seen that? Well, you notice they've now kind of backed down on that a little bit. Their ad campaign now is beyond petroleum, dot, 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 it's a start. And you, if you look at most of what they're talking about, it's all greening, right? They're talking about, well, we're, we're reducing the amount of emissions from this gasoline and from that, you know, from this product and from this plant. Great, you know, but that's probably not going to solve the problems that we're really, we're really facing, <laughs> the daunting problems that we're really, really facing around climate change, you know, and global poverty. For that, we're going to have to think about beyond greening. That's about this notion of clean technology, you know, the, a sustainability vision. It's about tomorrow's technologies and markets, underserved markets. It's how can companies become a positive force and grow and profit in the process. That's, that is the fundamental opportunity that we have. 
But you know, even as a final step there, yes, beyond greening, sustainability vision, clean tech, those are pieces of the puzzle, but we have to carefully avoid not being an alien force. Because I think this is, where, this is where we are now in terms of the next sustainability challenge. If you think about you know, creating a roadmap for targeting the unmet needs of the base of the pyramid, the BOP, uh, or the idea of deploying sustainable leapfrog technology to the future, well, we've seen some examples of that. I mean, there have been some early attempts. Sustainability vision, you know, creating a roadmap for meeting the unmet needs. For those of you that come into my concurrent session, we'll look at a case by Nike, you know, to try to create something called the World Shoe, which is an affordable uh, footwear product for those in the developing world. It didn't come off so well, you know, and we'll be able to diagnose that a bit in the concurrent session. But it was more or less dropped in from Oregon, you know. It is, is this sort of alien force that just, we have a tendency to think we know, right, and we can design the problem in, you know, in California or New York and then drop it in, airdrop it in. That's probably not going to work. You know? Or in clean tech, deploying sustainable leapfrog technology to the future. Think about Monsanto's attempt, you know, in GMO. Kind of an alien, you know, it's just, it, it, it's a bit of an alien force. It, it's uh, that we as the company, we know it all. Uh, listen to us, we can deploy it in a way that will be good for you. Probably doesn't work so well. That if we're going to make this stick, we've got to get past this kind of alien mentality. We have to learn how to become indigenous. That becomes the real challenge. Uh, and that's where we think in terms of radical transactiveness and native capability. That radical transactiveness is about broadening the corporate bandwidth by engaging with stakeholders that we just never really thought of before. That's what Mohammed Yunus did. Right? He went out and actively sought voices, those voices who were most different from him, who were totally foreign from him, who we couldn't imagine working with, and that stimulated imagination and innovation. That's what really drove that whole new business, that whole new, that whole new strategy. And we see some signs of that. Companies like Semex in Mexico, uh, Hindustan Lever in India, I think, are, you know, are doing very interesting things by consciously seeking that out, requiring employees to live in shanty towns and rural villages, designing a process to bring uh, people in villages and make them micro-entrepreneurs as part of the company. You know, we can criticize Hindustan Lever perhaps as their early attempts at this were just to put their existing soaps and shampoos in smaller sachet packages, you know, and then sell them for a penny each. Interesting, but probably isn't going to get, get us to the solution. That in the end, if you're going to be radically transactive, it's more than just small packages. It's more about bigger mindsets. So we need to design a process to get there. It's about learning native capability. How do you co-invent contextualized solution that leverage local knowledge? Becoming native to the place. So I'll just close with uh, to suggest that we've got a project going called the Base of the Pyramid Protocol Project where we're working with a bunch of companies, DuPont, Hewlett Packard, SC Johnson, Tetra Pak, uh, to create a whole new business process to do the sort of deep listening I've just described, to generate imagination and then co-create new businesses. Uh, we've got an approach designed, I'll talk more about this as well in the breakout sessions, in the concurrent sessions. We've pilot tested it with SC Johnson. And, uh, you know, if you're more interested, if you're interested in hearing more about that, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it. But I think that these are the fundamental challenges of sustainability moving forward to move from being an alien force uh, to becoming native. So I think we're, we are standing right on the edge of, an, of an, a really historic period in time. I think that business has the tools, has the capability to drive us in the direction we need to go. I believe there are trillions of products and services out there that we have yet to create, yet to imagine. And there's untold you know, business opportunity if we can just open our mind to it. So my hope is that this provides at least a frame for thinking about this and maybe even a frame for thinking about it as we move forward in the meeting. So thank you all very much. We have time for just a couple of quick questions. Stu will be around tomorrow afternoon also for the uh, panel discussion. So if we don't get to your question today, don't worry. We'll have lots of time for questions tomorrow. But we will take just a couple of quick ones if anyone has something. Do we hang on just a sec? Ah, there we go. 
a long time for the microphone. Yeah. Uh, thank you for our wonderful presentation. I just wanted to ask about uh, sustainability and climate change and how it relates to the model at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, you know, of course, consumers in the developed world, uh, if we throttled back in the United States on our refrigerator uh, electricity consumption, that would save more greenhouse gas emission than the average African nation. So obviously a big part of that problem is here. And I'm wondering in particular about the role of public policy and how you view it, because it kind of got pushed to the back maybe in the interest of time. But I'm wondering uh, how you can um, evaluate public policy for the developed world and, and build uh, business strategies around that. Yeah. Well, I, I really wish, obviously public policy could be hugely important in driving us in the direction we're talking about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see that happening. You know, it, it seems to me that many of the public policies, not just here, right, and other parts of the world too, but many public policies, and political scientists have known about this for a long time, right, are captured by incumbent firms. Because incumbent firms, and incumbent firms are usually in existing incumbent industries, many of which are sunset industries, and most of which are premised upon unsustainable technologies. <laughs> I mean, look at our current energy policy. So it's, it seems to me very difficult to overcome that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it happening. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I don't depend on it. You know, I, I'm trying to think through, can we imagine a commercial model that doesn't require a tremendous, you know, sea change in public policy? If it happened, that'd be great. You know, I mean, I think that'd be fantastic. And I think we, you know, we need to keep working on that. But I'm, I'm looking at it through a commercial lens. And I think what I'm describing could actually happen regardless of what happens on the public policy front, that we can think about incubating the technologies of tomorrow in spaces that are underserved and generate whole new industries that become so competitive, eventually they're going to trickle up. And when they become three or four times better than what we've got now, they will simply outcompete what we've got. Now, is that a short-term solution? No. And one more question over here. A fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about higher education. You spend a lot of your time in higher education and you're moving up this uh, map to clean technology and sustainable visions. Um, do you see higher education as a laggard or a leader? Uh, and, and what's happening and what kind of hope do we have from these uh, imaginary intellectuals? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Higher education clearly should be one of the leaders, and I think it can be. Uh, but I'll be honest with you. I mean, I think today that that we're probably lagging, you know, in terms of higher ed. That because again, you know, universities are big bureaucratic institutions, and it's hard to turn that ship very quickly. You know, the institution of tenure has its pluses and minuses, and it's not so easy uh, for this stuff to break in in a significant way. Into, into, for example, into business schools. It's not so easy. It's changing. It's changing. I mean, I've been working on this. I've been at three different major universities over the last 15 years and have, you know, been involved in starting programs at each one. You know, I could show you my scars, <laughs> but it's, it's not so easy. Uh, and I would say, in truthfulness, because I spend a fair amount of time out there in companies and in NGOs, there's much more innovation happening in the companies and in the NGOs than there is in the universities. Or in government. <laughs> Thanks, Stu. And we will have, again, more time for questions.